All right, our last reader is David Cavanaugh, whose fifth book of poems is the recently released The Somnambulist and The Good Life. It's available over there. His previous collections are Straddle, Falling Body, The Middleman, and Cycling in Plato's Cave. He lives in Burlington, Vermont. Please welcome David Cavanaugh. <laughs> for welcoming us again. The store is a, a real gem. Mm -hmm. Great thing for us to visit. Mm -hmm. Jen and Susan and Austin again, and to read with Steve again. Fantastic, even if you did say cyclists are a fraud. <laughs> 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 um, I'm going to read from the new book, The Somnambulist and the Good Life, and also I want to mention uh, shout out to Sharon, who supplied the art for the cover. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not at all prejudiced, but I think it's beautiful. <laughs> Personal ophthalmology. The doctor peers inside my eyes, takes stunning pics, red, orange orbs, a far out galaxy within, and says he sees bleeding back there. I tell him it's from reading the news. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to treat me with cold laser, fire a shot to shut down some bad cells. Not what I'd call a treat. <laughs> and anyway, if not for the telltale leak of blood, how will I know where I've been, what's wrong, or how to understand this nagging, faulty vision, the beauty of what's barely seen, the brilliant, tear-streaked world of longing, the everyday? This poem's called The Thoughtfulness Project, and um, the notion of thoughtfulness kind of runs as a subtext through a lot of this book. It feels to me as if thoughtfulness is a kind of endangered species <laughs> these days. Uh, and there's an epigraph for this poem. I love your piece about epigraphs. <laughs> there's an epigraph for this poem uh, by my brother. Um, who also passed away a few years ago. I want to recognize the tenacious idea that a relentlessly gentle application of thoughtfulness might yet bring freedom to us all. Pat Kavanaugh. So the poem must fail its epigraph as a life inevitably fails its longings. But in those wants, and the earnest fumbling after them is such energy as might give rise, who knows, to sudden understanding, an untrod way, a trembling new engagement, and freedom for self or another. Who is to say then what failure means when we embrace our yearning? Mm -hmm. Um, this next piece is called A Man on the Fourth of July. Uh, it grew out of uh, a walk I took on the Fourth of July uh, a few years, a couple of years ago in Burlington, Vermont. First of all, I was walking down by the lake. It was a, a very hot day, maybe not hot by Austin standards, <laughs> but pretty hot by Burlington, Vermont standards. It was hot, it was steamy, there were a lot of <laughs> bugs around. <laughs> but it was by the lake and it was beautiful. And then I continued walking to downtown Burlington where there's a, a pedestrian mall where lots of people, a lot of restaurants and shops and also performing musicians quite often. Um, and this day there was a young woman um, playing a violin, playing solo, playing a very haunting tune.
some of you will recognize it. Amen on the 4th of July. An amazement to glimpse the sun-soaked grasses waving by a river and a blur of insects rising in a Pentecostal cluster near an overheated mind. Praise. A violin cradled against throat and cheek of a young, clear-eyed woman, knowing hands on downtown Church Street. Sweet keening, a faintly familiar lament strains of the Civil War, swollen, rotted logs of nationalism blown out of the water. The heart beats. The open heart knows what has gone before, what harms, what helps. The hurt heart turns inward, then out, and without ignoring anything, applause. The, the middle section, this book is divided into three sections, uh, the good life part one, then the somnambulist, and then the good life part two. So in the middle section there's a series of poems about sleepwalking, or based on sleepwalking. Um, there are obvious metaphors about sleepwalking, like sleepwalking through existence, which we all have to try to guard against. Um, but then there are other aspects of sleepwalking too, that, at least for me, that I, I find very mysterious and very compelling what's going on when people are sleepwalking. I don't know if any of you have really been sleepwalking. No. Yeah. I, I was when I was a child, and that's actually, and I stopped sleepwalking, uh, I, I can't remember exactly when, 10 or 12 years old, which I guess is fairly common. Children who right. sleepwalk tend to yeah. grow out of it, but sometimes yeah. people continue right into adulthood. And I actually have a colleague who uh, struggles with it really because he can get into some odd situation. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, anyway, well, maybe I'll read some of the odd situations. These these poems, the these few scenarios here. Are, are taken from actual events. Conundrum. For the Canadian man who drove 23 kilometers in his sleep, <laughs> strangled his father-in-law, bludgeoned his mother-in-law, stabbed them both, mom dead, dad nearly, then turned up at the cop shop, still deep under, and later was acquitted. For the Australian woman who had sex with strangers outside her house over several months while her husband snored inside and she herself slept through the couplings. For the 77 year old in Florida who strolled into a pond and woke amid a gnashing party of alligators, then beat them off with his cane till help arrived. What is there to say? How much have I done without knowing? What am I doing right now that I don't know? When you tell me later what happened, which of us is awake? <laughs> <laughs> You'd almost think, part one, when I sleepwalked, I wandered downstairs from the bedroom, through the kitchen, into the cellar, even outside once and down the block, I ate, I peed, I hummed. I never did have sex or murder anyone or drive a car. I did give my parents a fright. You'd almost think I was awake. 
Part two. Now that I'm awake, I walk, I wander through useful rooms, I eat, I pee, I hum, I go outdoors, I sometimes do have sex. I've never murdered anyone. I spoon cereal in the morning, I drive to work, I fret, I josh, I chew an evening meal, eventually make my way upstairs. You'd almost think I was asleep. <laughs> a little bit longer and I'll ask you to uh, yeah that's maybe I'll do that. Maybe one one more somnambulist poem. This one's called Good Morning Ambien. <laughs> and, and, and I I don't know if you know the origin of the word of the, the name Ambien of the the prescription drug aid. Uh, but it comes from the Spanish or maybe the French. It comes from the Spanish A M and Bien, uh, or the French, A.M. Bien, good morning. Good morning, Ambien. Sleep drifts in and settles like fog across the shoulders of low hills. The bruises I find in the morning are the colors of the horizon, muted. The corners of tables and low bookcases pointedly say nothing. What goes on after the curtain falls and why? I try to read from the blood blooms under my skin. Dark beauties, tell me the locked tale of your becoming, the perilous movements of drugged <coughs> night, the path of yearnings followed, not denied. Mm -hmm. So the title poem or part of the, one of the, part of the title, anyway. The Good Life is, that's maybe the shortest poem, well, it's not the shortest poem I've written, but it's the shortest poem I've published. It consists of two lines. There are six words in each line, and they're the same six words <laughs> in each line. The Good Life. The guilt of living in comfort. The comfort of living in guilt. <laughs> oh, Mama Earth. I think you are a weary single mom, beat up by the furious sun that lays down the heat. Teeming with us clamoring kids, you're driven to distraction, crack and heave under the pressure. Absorb, reproduce, die off. You can't think what else to do. As times fall undiminished and ravaged, you gamely try to Here's a, here's a, a short one uh, involving Neil Armstrong. I, there's a quirk, every, every, every one of my books except the first one has a little poem about work to Neil Armstrong in it. Um, as it happens, our nephew used to <laughs> cut his grass in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think I'm drawn to Neil Armstrong partly because, of course, the extraordinary things that he did, but also that, as far as I can tell, he was a, a very decent, humble human being. Um, what would Neil say? Back to the moon, please, quick. <laughs> <laughs> or, the moon is not far enough now. <laughs> or, my garage is filled with mementos. My garage is filled with forgotten stories. Or, come with me far above the earth. Look down, how beautiful still, but burning. How are we doing?
How are you doing? Good. Good. Two more. Two more. <coughs> this one's called Kilroy was here, and there's an epigraph over the phrase. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an epigraph. One theory of the origin of this saying is that James Kilroy, an American shipyard inspector during World War II, would chalk it on sections of ships he had examined. Many of the vessels were troop ships headed abroad. Servicemen and servicewomen carried the saying around the world and back home after the war. <coughs> Absent from the scene is Kilroy. A decent sort, diligent, meticulous, proud of his work to keep hundreds of tons of steel afloat to assure thousands could come home. An earnest, unseen man in a world of unseen foes, icebergs and torpedoes and sudden fire out of the sky. Kilroy wanted to get it right, wanted some small notice too, so left a tempered sign, a few words to carry his intention. First, chart what he'd checked. Maybe buoy himself with a bit of mischief or mystery. Imagine one who'd come later upon his Kilroy in a sealed compartment of an inner hull. Let the sailor know welds had been tested, rivets okayed by one such as him. Also, that he was gone. Mm -hmm. All his life, he may have wanted too much and fallen short, or too little, even shorter, or was fairly satisfied. In any case, he's gone, no one knows where, but he was here. <laughs> Everybody says so, if not so often anymore, and with no thought of the man who may have saved many. It slips out with a little laugh, as if not quite sure what it means. They say it and move on, as Kilroy did, but different. Ships sailed upon his mark, came back, some not. But he was here, no doubt. He chalked the words. Mm -hmm. 800% bigger than the smallest audience I've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> And you've been great. It's really been enjoyable. And thanks again to Sharon and to Steve. Pleasure to read you too. Um, so this last poem, I'll read an epigraph. Uh, actually, uh, there's, uh, before I read the poem, I'll read two short epigraphs, one of the epigraphs today, uh, to the book. First one's from Mississippi John Hurt, song C.C. Rider. If I had to listen to my second mind, Lord, I wouldn't have been sitting here wringing my hands and crying. <laughs> <laughs> and the second epigraph is from Don Mackay, who is arguably Canada's greatest living poet, to speak of paths, from his poem to speak of paths. Which way is the way? question to be pondered, and if possible, it walked. <laughs> so this poem is called, and I'll end with this, Walking Thought. Who are we when we sleep? Are we more or less ourselves? Sleepwalker, are you pulled mindless on hidden wires, or do you chart a chosen path? What I fear or who I want to be. Never mind. Never that mind. Let me find another. The body's mind that feels the ground it travels. Second mind that knows about mirrors. No telling if waking sleeps or sleep awakens. But I love the rise and fall of music, the fading shore, beauty new and old, I walk in wonder's thought.
alone, or blessedly with you, or you, the blazing surprise of morning, its graceful daily demise. <laughs> lovely poetry. Um, we, two of our uh, readers have books available for sale over there on the table. If you decide to purchase them and ask nicely, I bet they will sign them for you. Um, please also eat the snacks um, and have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.